We read from the Gospel of John. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. You're welcome here today for this service of thanksgiving for the life of Adelaide Eleanor Stewart. I'll call her Eleanor from this point because that's what I knew her as, Aunt Eleanor. And just want to welcome you on behalf of the family and thank you for your kind expression of sympathy by being here today. I'm just going to open in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you that we can come together for this time of a celebration, a celebration for the life of Aunt Eleanor. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you will bless these moments that we have over the next hour or two. Lord, I just pray for the family who are here, Lord, that you will provide comfort and a peace, Lord, and just the knowledge that Eleanor is with you in heaven, with you in paradise. Um, no health issues, and, and, and Lord, she's just there with you and enjoying that time. And Lord, we just thank you for this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we'll open with a hymn. If you want to stand, love lifted me.
we're going to have um, some readings now, and I'll, I'll just announce all three readings at the one time. Gareth's coming first, then Danielle, and then Alexander. So, Gareth. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had, di earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne, saying, saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his own people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. Uh, Psalms 27, verse 1 to 5. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even of mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though a war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Um, Psalms 91, verse one to four. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your, army, or your armor and protection. Thank you for those comforting words. There's nothing as comforting as the word of God. Amen. I'm going to ask Audrey to come now and say a few things about her mum. You'll forgive me if I don't look at any faces. On the 20th of January, 1953, a beautiful baby sister was born with four, four older brothers and four older sisters. Eleanor was not the baby for long. Soon she became the big sister to two more brothers and three baby sisters. Mum was in basically the middle of such a large family, but she loved them all. And I know that she was greatly loved too. Even as a little girl, mum told us that she loved to dress up. And she would often dress, change from dress to dress and dance around the room, being told off for changing her clothes so many times in a day. But she never lost that love for the nice things. She was always well dressed. She loved her shoes, her handbags, her jewellery and all the rest of it. When mum was 17, she had an encounter that would change her life and that happened in the Waveney Hospital in Ballymena. The pastor was called to come and pray for her and he brought along her brother-in-law, John Rainey, and a young man called Bert <laughs> to pray for her. And that night, not only did she meet the man that she would marry, but she met the man called Jesus. 
She accepted Jesus as her personal Lord and Savior. And although she had many questions and trials, the one thing she never doubted was her salvation. And after that, it was suggested that this young man of God would teach Eleanor how to drive. But I think mum was more interested in the driving instructor <laughs> than she was in learning to drive because she didn't actually pass her test for till about seven years after they were married. <laughs> she told me that she had prayed, Lord, if this is the man for me, then let him put his arm around my shoulder and if I feel your peace, I will know it. And she said shortly after that, that dad just put his arm around her shoulder, pulled her head into his like he still does with many of us today. And she felt safe and she felt the peace and she knew that was it. But yet there was one day when she, she fell out with him. <laughs> dad said it was probably about something to do with the driving. And she went into the house and totally lost my notes. She came into the house uh, in a bit of a huff, and those who know her knows what that is. And her mother told her, go right back out there and don't let that man go because you'll never find another one to look after you the way he will. Granny Henry was a true prophet that day for her words certainly came to pass. On the 27th of May, 1972, mum and dad were married. That was 52 years just this past week. Their first house was on the top of the hill just overlooking this property where they would eventually make their home. And mum was a true homemaker from day one. No matter where they lived, she made every place her own little palace. She told me that she was the talk of the village when they moved into their first bungalow in Tobermore because all the doors there were painted a horrible green color. <laughs> Dad said it was the worst color he'd ever seen, very dark green. And she didn't stop until she had every door painted brilliant white. I think she did it in less than a week. <laughs> so she certainly was the talk of the time. Not only that, she never lost her County Antrim accent. And she had many sayings that we still laugh about today, but too many to tell you about. Their family began with a beautiful baby girl, <laughs> me of course. <laughs> Mum was a self-confessed daddy's girl and she raised two more, just like herself. Less than two years after that, a bouncing baby boy came along who will always be Charles to us, but to everyone else it seems he's known as Charlie. Who, by the way, for many years maintains that he was born first. It was thought that that one, that one girl and one boy, their family was complete. More than mum could have wished for. But about six years later, mum decided that she really wanted another baby. And what mum wanted, mum got. So Evangeline was born. A blessing beyond words. Then in 1992, Mum became granny. She loved being a granny just as much as she loved being a mother. And now with seven very handsome grandsons and four very beautiful granddaughters and a daughter in a granddaughter in law and a grand or a daughter in law and two sons in law. She had her own very large family. We couldn't all meet together 
and the Sunday we used to meet or, or on the Christmas morning we used to come in so mum could open her presents but we had to stop that because there was too many of us. She didn't always have the right words to express herself but she loved each one and was very proud of us all. She's the quiet one as you all know and mum the talker. She could never understand why we didn't talk so much and we often joke that mum did the talking for all of us. But everyone wants to leave a legacy in this world, one beyond the material possessions, and mum has achieved an excellent legacy. Dad taught us to know the true living God and his ways through example and experience and revelation and true authority. But it was mum who taught us how to read, how to read our Bible. She wasn't much into our schoolwork. But the one thing she taught us, you read your Bible daily and you read it out loud. She taught us how to pray. Mum was a real woman of prayer, but not religious prayer as many know it, but prayer that God answers. And we knew from an early age, if mum has her Bible open, you just leave her to it. And many of you in this room will never know how much she prayed for you. And many times being warned in a dream or just knowing in her spirit that urgency to pray. She knew to pray for you before you even knew you had a problem. And she would often say, I will pray until I hear from God. I remember shortly after learning to drive, and I had passed my test. And one morning she would not let Daddy and myself go to work before she prayed because she was warned in a dream about a car accident. <coughs> and she prayed with us before we left. And on my way home from work that day, I was driving a 1980 Mini, <laughs> which you felt every bump and you knew everything. But on the way home from Macrofelt, um, at Peden's there most some of you will know it there's a bad corner but just in that corner and I was coming this way there was a tractor coming the other way and a lorry overtaking the tractor and the girl that was with me she still she still didn't know what had happened but it felt like the mini was lifted just like that and then gent gently set back on the road and I believe that was mum's prayer that morning. Another one to give you an example of what mum was like. She tells us about after dad had the, um, been told about his heart and needed a major operation, um, she saw a man well dressed, tall, she didn't recognize him, but he walked into their room in the middle of the night. And she was wake and she saw him walk past her bed, around the bed and come round and put his hands into daddy's chest. And she said he never spoke. He just walked by it out again. But daddy never needed that operation. And that was 91. So that's the type of woman that mum was. She was the one who would suffer before she would want you to suffer. But isn't that just our Lord and Savior? He suffered in our place. Dad being the quiet one is the preacher that we all know. Although mom could preach and her best sermons were probably to dad at late at night before they went to bed. But I remember many years ago, she spoke from this very pulpit, a message from Psalm 32, and I can remember it clearly. She spoke in the joy of forgiveness, because that Psalm says, blessed is the man whose iniquities are forgiven, whose, whose sins will never be remembered. And I remember so clearly how she spoke with the passion and the real conviction and the blessing 
just about that blessing of knowing that God forgives our mistakes and forgives our wrong choices and our wrong, our sins, never to be remembered again. And that's how I will remember mum. That is her legacy to us. For when all is said and done, regardless of the good times or the bad times, to know the one whose love never fails and to call him Lord of all. So as a family, we want to thank you all for being here today. And we thank you for all your kind messages and your prayers, your words of support. We greatly appreciate it all. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Audrey. Thank God for the prayers of a godly mother. Um, if you have dark green doors in your home, we apologise for that. <laughs> maybe you, maybe you like them. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a fashionable thing today. Um, and if your mother was able to paint their doors in a week, I have a new house and I have to paint 18 doors in the next couple of months. <laughs> so if anybody wants to help me with that, um, please come along. We we were there on the Sunday here on Sunday uh, whenever Helen came. And it was interesting because she was going through all of the names. Now, I thought our side of the family was a lot because there was 12 of you, Bert, all my aunts and uncles and everybody else, till I realised on Sunday that that was nothing. There's 15 on the other side of the family. And dear Helen, her ink nearly ran out of her pen when she was writing down all these names. And, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is you know, an amazing sort of legacy, really, isn't it? And so... Look, it's good to be here. I love to hear what people say about oh, their, their, their loved ones at funerals. Whenever I go along to a service, I always enjoy that. Uh, you know, it's nice to hear, because there's things that you hear that you don't know, and, and it's just fantastic. Just to, And you get a glimpse inside the world of, of people, uh, and that's great, and I enjoy that. Um, and, if, and of course, this is a sad occasion, uh, but we're here to celebrate the life uh, and the legacy, and also the fact that Ellen is with our Lord. You know, she's not going to choose to come back today. Um, she's healthy, she's well, and it's just a great, it's, it's a great thing, obviously, from that perspective. But I just want to share for a few minutes from a portion of scripture that many of you will be familiar with. It's John 14. It's it's a portion of scripture that's often used at a service like this. It's a it's a portion of scripture that per, has been a personal reflection to me, a personal comfort to me over the years I, I really enjoy these verses so I want to talk just a bit about the first few verses um, of John chapter 14 but I want to sort of set a scene for you first of all before we get into it and so the scene is this is the last night before <coughs> Jesus's betrayal you'll know that he was there for the Passover meal you'll know that that has become known as the Last Supper um, and so Jesus is there he's there with his disciples He's there before what we know was his betrayal and his death and his resurrection and his ascension. But in that moment, the disciples didn't know that. So Jesus is there and he's speaking to him and he's preparing them or he's trying to prepare them for the days. And I say trying because some of these guys just weren't getting it. Um, and if you know anything about the Bible, you'll know very often the disciples just didn't always get it. They were a wee bit slow in the uptake. And it sort of helps me to sort of feel a wee bit more comfortable sometimes whenever I'm a little bit slow in the uptake, that the very people who walked this earth with Jesus were a bit slow in the uptake sometimes. So Jesus is there and he's speaking to these guys about what's going to happen. And that's really what was happening. He had washed their feet. They had the Passover meal together. And then he starts talking to them. And actually it's recorded there over about three chapters in the book of John what Jesus was saying to them. And so for three previous years to this, obviously Jesus had walked the earth with these guys. And these men had been following Jesus and had been learning from his teaching and from his example. And they had placed their hopes in him as their Messiah. Of course they did. And they had placed their hopes in him as their deliverer. But yet they still didn't understand how that was going to happen. At that moment in time, they didn't know what was actually going to happen. And yes, Jesus had spent those three years talking to them. He spent these moments, these hours in this room talking to them and trying to explain to them uh, what was happening, but they still weren't quite getting it. And so after the supper, after the, 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 the tea, the, 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 the food that they had there, Jesus began speaking to them again about his departure, which led obviously to questions from the disciples. And we can read in John 13, 33, 
we can read there where Jesus said to them, he said to the disciples, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I have told the Jews, so I tell you now where I am going, you cannot come. And that didn't make sense to these guys, because these guys had followed Jesus to the ends of the earth for the previous three years. Yes, Jesus may have had his times of solitude. He went away and he prayed often in the mountains, but he always came back to them. They always knew where he was. And here's Jesus is saying, I'm going somewhere and you're not coming. And, th and that was difficult for them to understand. It didn't make any sense to them. So good old Peter, uh, if you know anything about the Bible at all, Peter was really, really good at opening his mouth to change feet. And, and, and again, that helps me to feel comfortable in the fact that these were ordinary guys who just didn't always get it so well. But Jesus, or Peter said to Jesus, well, where are you going? Now, you can imagine that they were with each other for three years. They were close friends. Um, these guys would have been quite young. People often have disciples in their mind as really older guys. They weren't. These guys would have been probably at this stage, maybe early 20s, maybe even late teenagers, some of them. And Peter himself may have been a little bit older than that, but not much. And so Peter says, well, where are you going? And that's just how he said it to him. And so the disciples didn't understand that Jesus was obviously speaking about his death that was coming. And obviously they didn't know about his resurrection that was coming a couple of days after that. And, and, and six weeks after that, that Jesus was going to ascend into heaven. So that's what Jesus is sort of talking to them about. And Jesus said here at the end of chapter 13, he says, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And I suppose that maybe still didn't make any sense to them and, and they were a bit concerned about that. And as, as Jesus continued to speak to them, as Jesus beget, be, continued to teach them, and if you want to read that, you can read that over those three and a half chapters, I think it is there in the middle of the book of, the book of John. He began speaking more plainly to them about heaven. He had to really spell it out to them and that's the context for John 14. And I'll read these first three verses and you'll have heard these first three ver verses of John 14 many, many times in a service like this. John 14, 1 to 3 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Isn't that a fantastic opening to that chapter? This is probably one of my favorite chapters in the whole of the New Testament. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Or some translations said, trust in God trust also in me because in my father's house are many rooms or mansions if it were not so would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and I'll take you to myself that where I am you may be also you've heard these verses if you've been at funeral services you'll have heard these verses but these verses really bring such comfort because they're opened by the words do not let your hearts be troubled and I can absolutely let you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Aunt Eleanor's heart is not troubled today. Not in the slightest. And I know that this is a time of difficulty. There's no doubt about that. And we've heard the emotion today. And of course people suffer loss. And that's always going to be a difficult thing. But Eleanor, Aunt Eleanor, is in heaven today. She's with her father. Her heart's not troubled. And Jesus would say, as believers, if you're a believer here today, let not your heart be troubled. Yes, it's okay to feel that pain of loss, but we're not to let our hearts be troubled. We have to trust God. We have to trust in him. And, and Eleanor, Aunt Eleanor, at that time of her, in her life, trusted God as her Lord and personal Savior. And that's the context here, where Jesus is saying, don't be troubled, trust me. Don't be troubled, put your trust in me. Don't be troubled in this meeting today, but put your trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was talking about going on here to prepare a place of eternal residency, a new home. That's where Adelner is today. He promised to come back for his church. That's thus if you're a believer. We're the church if you know the Lord Jesus as your own and personal Savior. But for some and for Actually, for everybody up to this point who have died and, and passed on, he's called them home early. It's almost like a promotion. They get a promotion to their heavenly destination. It's paradise. Jesus said to the, the thief on the cross, whenever the thief on his cross in his dying moments committed his life to the Lord Jesus Christ, what did Jesus say to him? He said, today you will be with me in paradise today. And the Bible says that we, if we're believers, are absent from the body and we are present with the Lord. On Saturday night past, that's 
where Aunt Eleanor went. She was absent from her body and she was present with the Lord. She's in heavenly places. She's in paradise with her Lord. If Eleanor were here today, okay, I want you to picture this. If Eleanor was standing right here beside me, here and now, she'd tell you to come and join her. She would. She, she, might, she wouldn't come back. How could we ever be in the presence of God and come back? She's healthy. She's, she's got her perfect, perfect health and body and everything else that we're promised whenever we go to be with the Lord. And if she was standing here right now, that's what she'd say. Come join me. Come join me for eternity. Come be with me and my Father. Be with Jesus. Be with the person that we love. The person that we, if you're in here and you have that relationship with God, that person that we have that relationship with, but we can be physically with our Lord and Savior forever. And on Saturday past, that's what happened for Aunt Eleanor. She would want you to be in heaven with her. That would be her, your, her request to you right now. But how do you do that? It's one thing for someone like me to stand up here and tell you what the issue may be, but I need to tell you what that you can do about it. There's nothing as bad as me telling you there's a problem without giving you a solution. Isn't that right? Well, the next three verses give us our solution. The Bible's fantastic, by the way. Just open it up and read it. It gives you all the answers. They're all right there from start to finish. And you don't need any sort of theological degree to understand them. Just open them up. Yeah? I'm not going to shout today, Bert. I promise. Okay? You want me to shout? So let's read these next three verses together. I'll read them to you. John 14, 4 to 6. And we've given you the context of what Jesus was speaking to the disciples about. He said, And you know the way where I sorry, you and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas, so the other one. Do you remember Thomas afterwards who didn't believe Jesus was standing in front of him? Doubting Thomas? That's where we get that phrase from. Well, this is Thomas. Before the event, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how do we know the way? That's what he said. We don't know where you're going. Put yourself there. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? We don't know where you're going, so how can we get there? Well, Jesus said, and this is one of the most famous verses in the Bible, and hopefully I've put it in a context for you, because Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one, no one gets to the Father except through me. Isn't the Bible fantastic? Well, if you're sitting uncomfortable in your seat right now, maybe you know the truth of what I've just said. If you're a believer, hopefully you'll agree with me that that is fantastic. Because Jesus said in that moment, it's me. I'm the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And whenever Jesus says, I am there, I am is a very intense way of referring to yourself. It's certainly an intense way in the original languages that the Bible would have been written in and the language that Jesus was speaking. It was an intense way to refer to yourselves. And that I am, Jesus called himself the I am in John chapter 8. And we know, if you know your Bible, in the Old Testament, God called himself the I am. That's such a powerful phrase because um, it actually reflects the very name of God in Hebrew, which is Yahweh. And it means to be, or it means to be the self-existent one. I love that. I love the fact that Jesus and God could call themselves the self-existing one. In other words, they existed within themselves. They always were. There was no start. There'll be no end. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit always were and always will be. And this Jesus was standing speaking to these disciples in this moment. These knuckleheads. Let's call them that because that's what they were. They weren't getting it at all. And that's a reflection of you and I, by the way. And he says, this is the name that has all power. This is the name that has all authority. This is the name that Jesus claims as his own. And he says, I am the way. And by saying that he is the way, Jesus is actually saying that he is the only way. Amen. How many times in this world today do you hear that there are many ways to glory? No chance. And I would imagine that everybody in this room, hopefully, will understand that to a point but if you're sitting here today and you think well maybe maybe the fact that i'm good maybe maybe the fact that i've helped other people 
I've spoke to people in different parts of the world. I'm involved in missionary work and I speak to people in different parts of the world. And I've yet to meet a person who doesn't think they're good enough for heaven. I've yet to meet that person. But yet do you know that none of us are good enough for heaven? Aunt Eleanor in her own right was not good enough for heaven. But it was the fact that Jesus is the way and that he paid the ultimate price that opened up the door for Aunt Eleanor to go to heaven. It opened up the door for me and Bert and everybody else in this room that knows Jesus as their own and personal saviour. That's the only reason why. Nothing that we can ever do to earn that. Nothing. Zero that we could ever do. And Jesus says, I am the way. And a way is a path or it's a route. And the disciples had expressed their confusion about where Jesus was going and how they could follow him. And as Jesus had told them from the beginning, for the last three years, he was saying to them, follow me. Follow him. Follow Jesus. That's the way. How do we follow Jesus? Because there is no other path to heaven. There is no other route. There is no other religion. There is no other ideology, philosophy. Call it whatever you want. There is no other way to heaven but through the Father. And Jesus says, I am the truth. And again, Jesus is saying that he is the only truth. Remember that Jesus is the word of God. If you know your Bible, you'll know at the start of the book of John that John tells us, the Apostle John says, that in the beginning was the word the Word was God, the Word was with God, and nothing was made without the Word. We know that the Word is Jesus. And whenever you read about these things in Scripture, Jesus is saying, I am the Word of God, I am the truth. And in the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm sure that you've all heard of the Sermon on the Mount, the most fantastic teaching ever captured or written down in Matthew 5, 6 and 7. And Jesus often pointed out in that sermon to the people, he says that you will have read or you will have heard about this and that. And he was referring back to the law of Moses, the law of the Old Testament. And then Jesus, after saying, you will have heard. And then he says, but I say to you, Jesus was equating himself with the law of God. He was equating himself with the word of God. And he was saying and stating that I am the authoritative standard of righteousness. And so whenever Jesus says, I am the truth, Jesus is saying that I am the word of God and I am the source of all truth. Whenever the Apostle Paul wrote to the young pastor Timothy, who was a pastor in a very evil place called Ephesus, he pointed out the fact that all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture, the word of God is given by God and it's for teaching, for correction, for rebuke and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, lacking nothing. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the definitive word of God. And so whenever Jesus says, I'm the truth, he's saying, I'm everything that the word of God represents. And he goes on to say that I am the life. Jesus had just been telling his disciples about his impending death. And now he was claiming to be the source of all life. That doesn't make sense, does it? Well, let me explain it to you. Because we know that physically, Aunt Eleanor passed from life to death on Saturday, but only physically. Let me read you a verse again. Everyone in this room could quote it to me. Psalm 24, 4 says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You know what happened on Saturday night? Yes, physically, Aunt Eleanor died, but spiritually, she did not. Spiritually, she walked through a valley of a shadow. She's walked into life. And see, whenever you read the Bible, let me give you a tip on reading the Bible. Whenever you read the Bible and it talks about life and death, it actually is talking about an existence and an eternity. And if it talks about death, that's an existence in a place called hell. And if it talks about life, that's an existence in paradise with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so whenever we read about things like this, yes, the physical body may die. Yes, the remains are here and they're in the home and we'll bury them today. But Aunt Eleanor lives on. She lives on with Jesus in heaven. There's nothing better. And I don't understand why people don't grasp that. I, and I'm not being, hopefully it doesn't sound like I'm being patronizing, but I can't understand why people don't grasp that message. It's a simple, simple message. And Jesus had already told them. Jesus had already told his disciples, I have authority over all life. John 10, a few chapters earlier, John 10, 17, 18, 
Jesus said to his disciples, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. And later on in John 14, Jesus says, Because I live, you will live also. Jesus is all life. Do not think for a second that when Jesus died on the cross that somehow that was a failure in heaven. It was always the plan. It wasn't like it took God by surprise. It wasn't like that God went, oh no, they're sticking him on a cross. It was always the plan. I'm shouting now, Bert. I promise you I wouldn't. It was always the plan. I'm telling you. From before time began, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit always existed and the plan always was the cross. The plan always was I am the way, the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. That was always the plan. The devil didn't get a victory that day. The devil's just a puppet. The devil's more afraid of a saint on their knees, by the way, than you'll ever imagine. Because the Bible tells me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And if we listen to the devil's lies, yes, he'll keep us quiet. I'm never going to be quiet. This was the plan. The deliverance Jesus was about to provide was not a political or a social deliverance, but a true deliverance from a life of bondage to sin, death, and to a life of freedom and eternity. In these words, Jesus was declaring himself as the only path to heaven, the only true measure of righteousness, and the source source of both physical and spiritual life. Can I read you a quotation from a Bible commentator, a guy called David Gusick? Here's what David Gusick says in his Enduring Word commentary. I love this. And he's speaking about someone who has not yet found their way. I am wandering about. I don't know where I'm going. Jesus is the way. I'm confused. I don't know what to think. Jesus is the truth. I'm dead inside. And I don't know if I can go on. Jesus is the life. Do you want me to read that to you again? I know it's being recorded. You can watch it later on TV if you want. But let me just say it again. I am wandering about. I don't know where I'm going. Is that you? Jesus is the way. I'm confused. I don't know what to think. Jesus is the truth. I'm dead inside. And I don't know if I can go on. Jesus is the life. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus made this remarkable statement claiming that he was the only way to God. And and in this he set aside all the temple and its rituals as well as every other religion by stating that no one, no one goes to the Father. There's no one goes to heaven except through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And it does not matter how good you think you are. And I know that sounds disparaging, but I'm not good enough. I've never been good enough. I have never been able to earn that in any way or capacity whatsoever. It's my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. And it's only through that sacrifice that I can only then be worthy of heaven. It's as simple as that. It's not a difficult message. It's simple, simple, simple. So how do you follow him today? The same way the disciples did long ago. The same way Aunt Eleanor did. And if she were here today, let's picture her again. If she were here today, she'd tell you that. Would you? She would, Bert? She'd tell you? If she were here today, that's exactly what she would. She would tell you what I've just told you. Only she'd be better at it because she's there. She's been there. The disciples heard the words of Jesus and believed them. They took his words and obeyed them. They confessed their sins to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They believed that he died to take the punishment of their sins and rose from the dead to give them new life. You know, the Bible is clear. Every last person who has been born into this earth, other than Jesus himself, is born in sin. It's shaping in iniquity. That's what we are. And the Bible tells us that the wages of that, 
is actually death in a place called hell and existence in a place called hell. That's what the Bible says. But the Bible tells us that whilst you and I were in that condition, that actually Jesus died on the cross for us. And then it says that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. In other words, if we confess with our mouths that Jesus did that for us. And if we believe it right here, if we believe it in our hearts and not in our heads, then the Bible says you will be saved. That's the simplest gospel message that I can give you today. There's nothing complicated about it. There's too many people make it complicated. And as I've already told you, these disciples were very uncomplicated guys. Knuckleheads, I think was the phrase that he used. I don't know if that translates well into Mid-Ulster or not. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm from these parts, you know. I was eight months old when you got married, Bert. Eight months. And I'm only 40 now, so I don't know how that, I don't know how that maz adds up. <laughs> not too sure. That's a lie. God forgive me. I'm 42. No, that's a lie as well. Look. I'm done. I hope you've heard the heart of this message today. If that is something that you want to do and respond to that message, you find me today. Find anybody else here that you know is a believer. Talk to us. The most important thing that you can do today is get right with God. That's the most important thing that you can do. And so just as we come to our closing hymn, if you want to please stand with me. And then afterwards we'll give you some direction and we'll close in prayer. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness. 
okay, if you just remain standing just a wee second, just a couple of wee directions, and then I'm going to close in prayer. So in a moment or two, the family are going to leave, the remains are going to be brought out of the house, and they're, they're going to be carried, I believe, a short distance. Um, so let the family out first, and then please file out so that, so that we can be part of that. And then you're all invited up to the top of the town for the burial at Tobermore Presbyterian, and then back to the McKinney Hall um, for... I think they refer to it in this part of the world as a wee cup of tea. Is that right? Yeah. So I'm going to pray, and then if you could do those things. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this service of celebration, yes, Lord, for Aunt Eleanor. Lord, it's just been fantastic to hear about her life. Lord, it's been good, Lord, to, to study your word, to understand what you mean whenever you say those things that we read. And so, Lord, we just pray a continued comfort on the family here, a continued comfort, Lord, as they go and they bury Aunt Eleanor, Lord, and, and get that time to spend with friends and fellowship with each other in the coming hours, Lord. But most of all, Lord, as they go out into the quietness of their weeks, Lord, just bless and be with each of every member of this family, Lord, just so that they can deal with the loss that they have suffered. But Lord, knowing that Aunt Eleanor is with you in paradise yes. and that she is happy and healthy and well. And so Lord, we just thank you for this time that we've had. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. 
Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great the war 